Good afternoon. I'm Dick Thornton, and I'm pleased to be the initial speaker in a program presented by the Climate Initiatives Group at Newbury Court called Electric Cars Past, Present, Future. Um, the program consists of me talking about the past. Tracy Clark will talk about the future. We have three people who own electric cars here who will come give you a brief experience that they have. And then after that, you'll be able to see their cars out front. Uh, at the end of Tracy and I's talk, uh, we'll have a break. Anybody wants to leave can, but I think um, a lot of you may be interested in actually kicking the tires out there. Um, I think it's important to recognize that nobody invented the electric cars. Uh, nobody invented the automobile. The airplane was invented because it took clever, creative ideas about control and propeller design and engines. But the automobile evolved naturally. We had, in the 1700s, we had air powered. Then we had military steam powered because locomotives were steam and you just put some wheels on them. And so um, the automobile evolution uh, was, was one driven by the available technologies, and this is the theme of my part of the talk. I'm going to start the talk in 1900. My father's 12 years old, my mother's one year old, and that's really about when the modern automobile evolution race started. I call it a race because it is a race, and it's an evolutionary type of race. The, because the steam locomotive was well underway by now, it's not surprising the first uh, vehicles were steam vehicles. Now, this was a bus that operated in London. Um, it was considered very dangerous by the parliament. They passed a legislation requiring a person with a red flag to walk in front of it because, well, that's just one example I'll show you of many where there's a total disconnect between innovation and politics. It's been plagued my life. But at any rate, steam became very popular. And about 40% of the market uh, in 2000, in 1900, was uh, was steam powered. They were more modern than that by 2000, by 1900. Um, the electric car had to wait for the battery. The electric motors were available in the early 1830s, but it wasn't until some Frenchmen between about 1860 and 80 uh, invented the lead acid battery that it was practical to have an electric car. But as soon as it was, the car appeared. Of course, they all looked like horseless carriages. They hadn't yet got the idea that maybe you didn't have to sit out front in the open. Um, but they all started that way as horseless carriages. Carl Bentz was convinced that the right answer was the internal combustion engine. But in 1900, they only had about 12% of the market. He quickly went to a four-wheel four vehicle and, and was very successful. But this is about where the race stood for evolution in the year 1900. Now, by the year 2010, electric cars are popular, and so are steam cars. Uh, the Stanley Brothers from Newton, Massachusetts, had a, produced the Stanley Steamer, which was very popular. Uh, the the uh, women liked them. You didn't have to crank them. Um, you could just plug them in. And by the way, this was just about the time the, uh, the interstate electric utility system started to be developed. Much before this, you would have had trouble charging your car. Uh, men like the faster cars, like the Porsche. <coughs> they, they still have the idea you have to be on the open. They haven't quite figured that one out yet, but they're moving ahead. The electric cars were the first cars to reach 60 miles an hour. Um, very popular. Um, 1920, internal combustion is winning for now. Um, ben Stamler, Patton, Olds, Ford, Renault, a whole slew of clever people started building them. Ford had the idea that he wanted to build a car that his workers could afford. And he had about half the market by 1920, um, called the 10 Lizzie for everyone. But this was also the beginning of the, where cars could be a status symbol, like the Pierce Arrow. They had very elegant cars at this time period. Um, yeah. That it, it was. Um, and I think it's important to understand that how these uh, luxury cars lead the pack. A lot of the technology first developed for the luxury cars migrated down to the lesser cars. Well, this is the beginning of a trillion dollar industry over the next 40 years, automotive, oil refineries, highway builders, the interstate highway system, huge expansion. But evolution is evolution and it changes. 
Detroit, we have a problem. It's 1960. Finally, people are realizing you can't just go this way forever without rethinking. Uh, the um, air pollution is becoming a serious issue. Uh, a lot of talk about how to deal with this. Um, it was interesting that um, the automotive emission problems forever changed the automotive world. I think this is about 1960 is when the world changed. I know at MIT we began to get much more interested in research on things like electric cars. It wasn't long before 1965 a, a clever student at Caltech challenged MIT students to a transcontinental electric car race. Wally Rappel, uh, and he found a group of students at the number six club at MIT, um, and uh, they responded to the challenge, and they went out, they persuaded GM to give them a Corvair. You remember Ralph Nader, unsafe at any speed? Well, it was a great car. It was, it was the first American car with an air-cooled rear engine. We just took out the engine, they did, took out the engine, put an electric motor, and filled the front with, uh, with ice, uh, with batteries, I mean. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> about a ton of NICADs. Now, Wally only had lead acid batteries, and he was going to take a few hours to charge, where we wanted to charge in a fraction of an hour. So they persuaded the manufacturer to give them about a t almost a ton, $10,000 worth of NICAD batteries. I can well remember that May Day when we went out for a test ride, now, half a dozen support vehicles following this MIT electric car. They were very clever. They cut off the rain gutters to cut down the aerodynamic drag. And, and by the way, nobody has any rain gutters anymore. I think MIT set the style for this. Um, it was a very sleek car. And we drove out about 40 miles on the mass turnpike, turned around, came back, and put it on fast charge. No problem, right? Wrong. <laughs> the next morning, they found the car was really hot, to, too hot to touch. It had gone to thermal runaway. Now, thermal runaway can be useful. That's how a fuse works, you know. What happens with a piece of metal, you put current through it, the resistance goes up, it gets hotter, the hotter it gets, the more the resistance goes up, and pretty soon the fuse blows. That's what it's supposed to do. But what happens with the battery is you get a hot, it starts getting leakage current, the leakage currents make it get hotter, and the hotter it gets, the more leakage currents, and pretty soon it sits and cooks. And that's what happened. Um, it took about 20 hours for the car to finish dissipating all the energy. And there's a lesson here. Um, if you have a tank of gasoline, there's a lot of energy in it. If you have a big battery, there's a lot of energy in it. Whenever you have a lot of energy in one spot, uh, there's hazards. And you've seen this with the fires and batteries and personal computers and so forth. Well, MIT students being clever, uh, they had a solution, ice. So every time we charge, every 25 kilowatt hours of electricity, a couple hundred pounds of ice. Throw the ice on, charge it. And so the race was on. We drove night and day. Um, we had a few incidents, like when somebody got a short circuit, tripped the main circuit breaker, and cut off the power in town. But mostly, things went well till out in the deserts. Uh, a few hundred miles from the finish, they were coasting down a hill to save energy and forgot to shift the gear. The motor over-revved and destroyed. But, you know, we... we towed to Pasadena and call, call it a day. And the th two things I learned from this, MIT students really know how to have a good time. I mean, driving a night and day electric car is really was a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing is electric cars really were viable. We just weren't quite there. The technology wasn't quite up to the job. But we're getting close. Um, OK, things are beginning to change. Now it's 1970. OK, you know, I have to have a quiz every now and then to keep people awake. So the question is, who is that gentleman on the right in this picture? I asked, I asked uh, my computer, and, and she knew, Sherry knew. Somebody tell me who that is. It's Chief Justice in 1970. Huh? You got it. OK, that was a softball question. The hardball question. Uh, in 1991, he made a very famous quote about the Second Amendment. Anybody want to remember that quote? Remember, he was a lifelong Republican, appointed by a Republican. He's quoting on the Second Amendment. What did he say? 
Nobody knows that. Doesn't apply to individuals, just to militias. Here's what he said. The concept of a citizen's right to bear arms has been the subject of one of the greatest pieces of fraud, I repeat the word fraud, on the American public by special interest groups that I have seen in my lifetime. By the way, Nixon had quite a good environmental record. Under his jurisdiction, you had the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency was created, uh, lots of land was added from Alaska to the National Park. So uh, bipartisan efforts back then were protecting the air. And, but, so the Clean Air Act um, had bipartisan support for controlling the quality of the air and was soon followed by climate change issues. So the, we're, we're really seeing the beginning of a whole new evolution in the automobile business. Um, 1996, General Motors comes out with the, and leases the EV1. I had a friend who owned the EV1 in California. He loved the car. He and his wife drove it all the time. It was, a, it was quite a nice car. It's one step up technology now. We're, we're going up from, from the very earliest electric cars to the MIT Caltech car to the EV1. They have a high-speed induction motor. They have better power electronics. They have nickel-metal hydride batteries. It wasn't quite there, but it was almost there. I knew Paul Agarwal, the lead engineer on this project, and he knew that GM wasn't really committed. It was a token symbol to say they wanted to do something about air quality. And after only a few years, they withdrew all the cars. They were only leased. They were, none of them were sold, and they destroyed them, literally destroyed them. You can hardly find one today. In fact, uh, the, um, there's a documentary about um, <coughs> who killed the electric car. Um, it was really a sad story where they it, it was an industry effort to squash the evolution of the electric technology but for whatever reason. And that, um, however, time marches on. Electric cars are winning the race. It's 2003, and Tesla leads the way. They won the, the, the Tesla, Ian Musk was very smart. He came in at the high end with a car that was so good that Nobody could criticize it. Yeah, there are those people who say, if you don't have a gear shift, it's not a car. But a lot of people respect the fact of high acceleration, good speed, comfort, and beauty, quiet, efficient. Um, and then not long after that, we had the Nissan Leaf, which is a more affordable model. This is more of the Henry Ford approach, making something that people can more nearly afford. Um, the new Nissan Leaf just came out at 150 mile range. It's, Quite a reasonable car. It's very competitive in price with with other cars. Um, then there's another approach, and that's the Chevy Volt plug-in hybrid. The idea here is you, yeah, it's an electric car, but it's only got maybe 50, 60 mile range. If you want to go further, you start up a small engine that will keep the battery charged. And there, quite a few companies have these now. BMW, my my. Granddaughter drives the one that she loves. She plugs it into just a 120-volt circuit at night. Uh, and the next day, she can drive 50 miles without using any gasoline. So I think it's a good interim technology before we solve the charging problem. These are th models of these three cars are out front right now. And uh, owners of those cars will be talking a little bit about them later. Um, and I think they're a good representation of the electric car market today. Performance electric cars really, to me, show the future commitment. Here's a, here's a Porsche that supposedly has 600 horsepower, can go 300 miles, and they can go 0 to 60 in 3 and a half seconds and charge 80% in 15 minutes. Well, I'm not sure I believe that 80% in 15 minutes, but what I do believe is that the electric car is, is now superior to the internal combustion in every respect except for the charging issue. And the stakes are so huge that people will solve the charging problem. I might digress just a little bit on that. There are 47 charging stations within 10 miles of Newbury Court. One of them is in West Concord. Here's an interesting fact. If you, have, if you live in Concord, you can arrange for your car to charge between 10 p.m. and noon 
You can do it for 10 cents a kilowatt hour. That's about a little over two cents a mile, pretty cheap for travel. Uh, but then between noon and 10 p.m., you pay 21 cents. See, the utilities love this. They can use the off-peak charging. So you get into a whole new range now. How are you going to range the electricity? Um, so now New Record has a new residence. We've been moving in here in August. Sue and Glenn Brewer, and they have a plug-in Prius Prime, plug-in hybrid, with like electricity. So I, I called up the um, electric light plant and said, okay, we just want to put in an underground charging, un underground garage here. We want to put in a charging station. It's just like, you know, where you plug your dryer in, 30 amps, 240 volt. You, you, have, you buy a charger at Walmart or, or, or Home Depot for 500 bucks, and you connect it, you plug it in, and then you plug that into your car. It's not a big deal. Wrong. <laughs> How is Newbury Cook going to charge people for the electricity? Ken Kruger warned me about this, and I didn't want to believe him. You can't resell electricity. You can give it away, but you can't resell it. So I said, why can't Newbury Court just put a meter on these so they can charge Newbury Court residents for the electricity? Well, that's reselling, and that's not allowed. Well, we are lucky because the Cocky Municipal Plant is very, is very it's, first of all, it's owned by the town. Its mainly main interest is the town. We have a board on people I know on the board. They promised me to look at it as soon as possible. Um, it's a classic case. You know, you pass a regulation that's good for the time and it creates problems for the future. But um, there are these political innovation interlock uh, interactions problems that plague us, but I, we'll probably get over this. And I think as soon as we solve the charging problem, I think the race is over and the, the automobile manufacturers, the not leaders in the electric field will go the way of the Pierce Arrow. Uh, here's another car, the Neo EP9. How about that one? 1,341 horsepower, 200 miles an hour. Uh, you know, you may think of these extreme, but that's important. It means that the automotive industry, the aficionados, they're committed. And, and the technology that they use for that is going to help everybody. One more slide. Did any of you see the Royal Wedding? Yeah. E-Type Zero Jaguar, 1968. Classic, right? Almost. Uh, Prince Harry bought this from the state of a relative. But Jaguar engineers are planning to introduce a classic electric car in September. And they took this car, they took out the gasoline engine, put in an electric propulsion system. Guess what? 100 pounds lighter, higher acceleration, much less noise, virtually no maintenance. Harry had a choice of about a dozen fancy cars, Rolls Royce, you name it. He picked the electric car, smart guy. Well. That kind of brings us up to the present. Um, I have one, one more comment. Um, I should have mentioned this before. Uh, automobile accidents are going to happen, and electric car accidents are different. In California, they train the firemen to deal with automotive accidents. And as I said, I think one report I read was a case of a car that had a battery self-discharge problem. I called the Concord Fire Department. They have not yet gotten that far, but I think they will. Uh, I think that we're moving ahead to where the, the electric vehicle is going to... Well, let's see. The big question now is what happens one year, two years, five, fifty, a hundred? So, Tracy Clark, let's take us to the future. So, uh, Dick did a, a fine job of talking about some of the turn of the century, cool electric car things. Um, I, I think it is interesting looking at some of the history, some of the early Baker Electrics and, and uh, the socialites in New York City driving around and showing off their clean, fancy electric cars, almost like an extension of their living room, you know, driving around in their electric cars. Uh, it, it turns out um, right around the turn of, of that century, we had uh, an unfortunate incident, uh, an att attempted assassination of a president. He was shot, and uh, the ambulance that rode him to the uh, to the emergency room at a high rate of speed was was an electric vehicle. Uh, this was in 1901. Uh, uh, president McKinley, 
uh, uh, was in the Buffalo area at the time. And uh, so electric cars were really a normal part of, of everyday life in that era. Um, as Dick said, you know, a, a century goes by of, of uh, internal combustion car dominance, and there were a lot of reasons that that, that occurred, and, and the industry supported that. Uh, but uh, my talk is mostly going to be about this, this second wave of electric vehicles. So at the start of this century, um, there was a, a, a new uh, breed of electric vehicles that started to take root. And, um, and I think there's good reason to believe that this wave might be more permanent for electric vehicles than the last one was. I'm going to distinguish a little bit about two kinds of electric vehicles that people talk about. One are the battery electric vehicles, or BEVs. Uh, these are vehicles which are purely or entirely electric. That is, uh, they don't have a gas engine in them at all. Uh, you have to plug them in to charge them. Uh, they can go until the battery is discharged, and, and then you need to be back at a plug again uh, to recharge them so you can, can uh, have another go at a trip. Um, some examples of these sorts of vehicles, uh, Tesla was one of the first comers in this wave with the Roadster. Uh, the Roadster was a, a small two-seater sports car, very nifty looking vehicle, um, sort of based on a Lotus Elise type design. Um, not terribly practical as an everyday driver, maybe, um, but nifty and, and great for the sports car enthusiast. And I think um, was an important moment in the electric vehicle world in that it, it represented a car that people could look at and say, yeah, maybe I can't afford that, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to. I mean, I like that car, not because it's electric, not because it's gas. I like it because it's a cool car. It's cute. It goes fast. It's a nice status symbol. And, and so it really changed the picture of what people thought of. When, they, when somebody mentions an electric car. Up until that time, you had you know, home enthusiasts building electric cars, good guys doing some cool things, but you know, they were, they were kind of golf cart-like. I mean, they, they, they just weren't really something that you looked at and said, wow. You know, the regular person didn't look at it and say, I I'd like to have that. They might have thought it was interesting, but they didn't really want to have it. Tesla changed the rules there and made cars that people wanted to have. Um, they soon after followed up the Roadster with um, the Model S, which was a, a four-door sedan, kind of a luxury high-end uh, car. Again, a desirable sort of car that people look at and say, wow, that, that's a nice car. I, I maybe can't afford it, but I like it and I, I would like to have it. Uh, and sales really picked up with the Model S. They've done, they've done very well. Uh, with that car and established themselves as um, sort of the marquee um, nameplate in the electric car industry. Uh, they soon followed that with the Model X, uh, uh, essentially a SUV style uh, on pretty much the same technology as what was being used in the Model S. So, you know, a little bit bigger, a little bit roomier inside to get that utility that a lot of people desire. Uh, still a high end kind of a a luxury brand sort of vehicle. Uh, and more recently, uh, they've introduced the Model 3. Um, started, well, just at the very end of last year selling the Model 3. Production is ramping up through this year. Uh, this is a, uh, still a, a nice vehicle, but not in the luxury class. They're aiming at a, a you know, more modest, $35,000, $50,000 sort of a price tag with the Model 3. It's supposed to be the electric that more of us can afford and really trying to move Tesla into the, uh, the mass production market. Uh, some other examples that I've put up here. Uh, Nissan was very bullish initially, and I thought they deserved some bullet space for that uh, in coming out with the Leaf. Uh, uh, Gone, the, the CEO at Nissan, made a, a, a very risky bet uh, for his career and his reputation by, um, at a time when nobody else really was in the established manufacturers, putting serious, significant effort into an electric vehicle that was going to be made um, widely available to the public. Um, a more utilitarian car than the Tesla, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just your basic little car. It's not a fancy one that people look at and wish they owned. 
except for maybe a few of us who like electric cars a lot. But it, it, um, it hit a price point and a utility uh, and a commitment level from a manufacturer that I think was pretty important. Um, BMW has an i3, uh, again, a battery-powered version of it in this case that um, um, is a unique look. It doesn't look like other BMWs, but they're trying to establish uh, uh, their presence in this electric vehicle space. Uh, Chevy had both a, a Spark EV initially, kind of a uh, really a, a, a California car. Uh, it, it was really to, to address the California rules for uh, zero emission vehicles. So it was somewhat of a compliance car, as it's called. Uh, really wasn't available um, uh, uniformly across the country. Uh, I do have a brother in California who owns a Spark, and, and, and he likes it. A uh, very small economy type car. Uh, they later came out with the Bolt just a couple years ago, a uh, battery electric version of, of a, a car that's um, competitive with the Leaf and, and uh, BMW. Um, by contrast to these BEVs, we have a, another type of electric vehicle, which is a, a hybrid, and in this case, a, a plug-in hybrid. So they, they have a gasoline-powered engine in them, which allows them to travel longer distances and refill with fuel at a gas station. Uh, but they also have a plug, which is important because it allows you to charge up the battery um, at home, and it allows you to get maybe fewer miles than the pure electric vehicles get, but a significant number of miles on electric energy only. Uh, so the Chevy Volt was uh, sort of one of the, the leaders in this category. Uh, roughly 50 mile electric range that you get on it, on the battery, uh, but then the, the gas engine can take over and, and take you for longer distance. Uh, Toyota has the Prius, they've had the Prius for quite a long time, since well, around 1990-ish, um, so multiple decades, uh, but fairly recently uh, decided that they could actually be talked into putting a plug onto it and, and making the battery a, a little bit larger. Still, um, not very much electric in the Prius. Uh, it's mostly a gas car. Uh, BMW has uh, another version of the i3, which has what they call a range extender in it. Uh, it. It's essentially the same car, but with this small gasoline engine and generator in it that allows it to uh, extend its range uh, beyond what you get from just the battery in it. And they also have the i8, which is very performance oriented. It's the, the one you see Tony Stark driving in the Iron Man movies, uh, pretty spiffy. Uh, Ford with the C-Max had a, a hybrid uh, showing. Let's talk a little bit about some of the manufacturers, and, and we have a bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe add a little more editorial comments into that. Um, in one camp, you have the newcomers, and that would mostly be Tesla to this stage. Um, had no presence in the internal combustion engine vehicle market. Um, they were formed with the specific uh, charter of, of establishing themselves as an electric vehicle maker and establishing electric vehicles as the thing that people want. Um, and they've been very successful at um, uh, uh, positioning themselves in a very tough market to break into. By contrast, you have some of the established players. Uh, and the first line I have here are, are some companies that committed earlier on to the electric vehicle game. Nissan with the Leaf, GM with the Spark, the Volt, the Bolt, BMW with the i3, the i8. They jumped on board relatively early in the game. Um, a raft of other manufacturers are now seeing um, their future and saying, we need to get into this game. So the Volkswagens of the world, after going through the diesel gate thing, and, and they've recognized that they really do need to get into this electric vehicle game. Hyundai, Kia, uh, some of the others are, are saying, look, we, a Porsche, we, we need to get into this game. It's where the future is, and it's where we need to go. You also have your feet draggers, uh, Toyota, Honda, Mazda. It's kicking and screaming, trying to avoid doing anything with an electric vehicle. Uh, they will come around. They will do it. It's only a matter of time. Um, some of these manufacturers are very close to hitting the, the sales limit for uh, availability of the US tax credit. Uh, 
There's a tax credit of $7,500 right now for the purchase of a new electric vehicle. That's good for any manufacturer until they sell 200,000 units. Um, after that point, the amount of credit available through that manufacturer uh, ramps down on a quarterly basis. So both Tesla and, uh, with the uh, uh, S and X uh, have sold very nearly 200,000 vehicles. Nissan with the Leaf has sold very nearly 200,000 vehicles. Uh, GM is further away from that, but still starting to knock up towards it. So it'll be interesting to watch what happens when some of the manufacturers have hit this limit, others haven't because they've been sandbagging and really doing nothing to promote electric vehicles. Will those companies be rewarded by being allowed to retain uh, the availability of a credit while the people who were, were, were risky and, and taking the initiative and doing what the incentive was intended to do be penalized by being ahead of the curve? It's going to be interesting to watch to see what happens there. I know what my vote would be, but I haven't had anybody really ask me yet about that. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> the companies who are avant-garde should be rewarded, and the companies who are sandbaggers, they should be punished easily. Yeah. Easy question on that. Here's a couple of charts that I think uh, are showing the past, but I think they're very indicative of what's going to happen in the future. The chart on the left is showing total vehicle sales worldwide, and there are different countries in different colors on the bars on that chart. In 2010, you can see it, it barely registers uh, for the number of cars sold that year. Uh, but it grows very, very sharply. And by 2016 was the last year that I had data for. We're selling nearly 800,000, um, a, a good piece of a million electric cars were sold during that year. And I think the thing that's really telling on this the growth is humongous from year to year. I mean, we're talking 100 down to maybe 50%, 40% growth. Very, very large growth year over year. So while I will admit that if we were to plot this 800,000 vehicles sold in 2016 versus the number of internal combustion engine vehicles that were sold during that year, that bar for the electric vehicles would be a very short bar but it's growing very quickly. And anything that grows that quickly is going to be an important bar soon. And it will. Over the next decade, um, I'm not going to stand here and say that electric vehicles will dominate, but I am going to stand here and say that they're going to be a significant, a very important aspect of the market. And any manufacturer who doesn't pay attention to it is, is doomed. The chart on the right is showing um, the amount of electricity that's used by electric vehicles uh, on a yearly basis. And a, a similar story, you know, you see in 2010, it doesn't even register with the precision that's available on this chart. Um, but it grows year by year very, very quickly. Again, we're talking about 40, 50, 60 percent growth year over year in the amount of energy that's being used by electric vehicles for the purposes of transportation. Um, last thing I'll point out on this slide before moving away from it, uh, in the car sales graph, take a look at that pink colored set, which is China. Uh, the growth for the last few years in China is unimaginably huge. I mean, those guys are, are really picking up with the number of electric cars that they're building. Let's talk about some of the commitments from companies going ahead, looking towards the future a little bit. And again, this is nowhere as near comprehensive, but I just wanted to point out a, a few uh, bullet points. Uh, one is from the International Zero Emission Vehicle Alliance. This alliance consists of uh, 13 countries and or states, uh, Germany, Japan, France, uh, California, uh, I, I believe Massachusetts is in it as well. Um, They've all committed to this alliance and, and this commitment to having all new registrations being electric by the year 2050. So it's pretty far off in the future, 30 years from now, but it's a pretty big commitment. Are they going to be able to change their mind by then? Yeah, sure, I guess they are. But they're thinking that it's important enough 
that they're making this commitment now. So I, I think that does say that there's some importance to it. Um, there are uh, some places that are even more bold. China, for instance, said, yeah, we're, we're going to do that by 2040. Uh, there are some city, London, is saying, we, we're going to do that sooner than that. We're going to do it by 2025. I mean, there, there are people making statements that perhaps they won't have their feet held to the fire on, but they're making the statements nonetheless about how important they think emissions are and how important they think electric vehicles are in addressing those emissions. Uh, ditto from the manufacturing side. Uh, we have companies like Volvo who's saying all new models that they come out with from 2019 on will have the option of an electrified form, either a hybrid electric or a battery electric form. That's a pretty big commitment. I think even more bold is that Volvo is committing to 50% of their total sales being battery electric vehicles by the year 2025. That's only six model years away, and that's a huge statement. Um, we'll see if, if they're going to come through with their commitments. Let's talk a little bit about charging. And the first place I'm going to talk about is the place where most people do most of their charging, if not all of their charging, and that's at home or perhaps at work. Um, these are places where you have your car parked for a significant time period. I park my car overnight at home, usually for at least eight hours, and in fact, usually for at least 12 hours. It's parked and available to be charged while I'm at home. It's available while I'm at work to be charged for maybe nine hours, right? So those are significant periods of time where the car is sitting there and doing nothing, and it's, it's perfectly happy to be being charged during that time. Um, most people call the piece of equipment hanging on the wall that does the charging a charger. Uh, technically, it's not. I have one here. Um, it's an EVSE, an electric vehicle support equipment. It doesn't really have any charging circuitry in it. The charging circuitry is all in the car. Um, what this essentially is, is a, a, safe, a safe outlet. Um, it gets its power from the wall. And in this case, it gets its power from a simple uh, 110, 120 volt plug. And it has uh, at its other end a, a plug that goes into the vehicle. And there's some electronics here that make it so that even though it's plugged in, the business end of it is not live. So unlike a normal outlet where if you stick your fingers or a paper clip or something in there, you could shock yourself. In one of these things, you can't. It's, it's dead. Um, and until it plugs into the car, and the car and the electronics negotiate with each other to say, yeah, I'm a car, and uh, here's how much power I have available, and here's how much I'd like to have. And they, they figure all that out, and that's what makes the uh, AC voltage live at the end of this plug, which is already plugged into the car. And then the electronics in the car can convert that AC power into the DC power that's needed to charge the battery in the car. Um, this plug is uh, uh, in compliance with a SAE standard uh, called J1772. And it's probably the most ubiquitous charging plug standard around. It's on um, almost every car sold. Uh, I'll make an asterisk there. Uh, with the Tesla, you need an adapter for some reason to do this. They do sell you an adapter so you can plug into a J1772. Uh, all the other manufacturers, it's a, a standard plug on the car that's available to plug into. And when you drive around, uh, uh, this is the most common um, uh, kind of charging plug that you'll see out there in the wild. Uh, Nominally, these uh, sorts of equipment are, are powered off of a 240 volt circuit, and uh, you can get power levels of about six or seven kilowatts from that circuit. So it's, it's about the same power level as a dryer that you might have in, in your house now. Um, and with that amount of power level, uh, it depends a little bit on the car as to how much range you get from that level of power. But um, about 25 miles of range for every hour that you're plugged in, right? So overnight, um, you could put 
roughly 200 miles worth of range into a car, an eight hour night or an eight hour stint at work. You could put 200 hours worth of range into a car with this type of a charger. Uh, this one I'm holding in my hand, uh, which I keep in my car driving around just in case I ever run out of battery charge while I'm out. I've never had it happen, but I, I have it in my car just in case. Um, and, and it plugs into just a regular old three prong, prong 120 volt utility, which you can find almost everywhere, right? Uh, this is not as much power capability as the dryer outlet does. Uh, with this one, you can get a, a little over a kilowatt, 1.2, 1.3 kilowatts. And so you can only get about six miles worth of range per hour of charging, right? It's, it's a lot slower. But in a pinch, could be better than nothing. Similar power to a toaster from this guy. Uh, on this sort of a charger, um, my car can fully charge in about a little over three hours, three and a half hours for sure. Uh, larger battery vehicles like a Tesla may take up to eight hours to fully charge uh, on a, a charger of this sort. Other than charging at home, what about if you're going to try to charge while you're out and about? So public charging. Uh, and the first category of public charging I wanted to talk about was destination charging. So you're, you're at a destination, um, maybe a restaurant, a uh, movie theater, or the symphony, or something like that, somewhere where you're going to be there for an hour or two. And you want to pick up a little bit of energy while you're there. Um, the most common connection out there for these is still the J1772, the same plug that you have at home. Um, the chargers tend to look a little different, like the one shown over here on the right. They maybe have two plugs on them so that two cars can plug in at once in adjacent parking spots. Uh, they usually have um, a more complex interface that um, uh, allows the, the lot to track how much energy is being used, how many people are plugging into it, perhaps even charging you for the privilege of charging your car there. Um, so there's a, a screen that's showing information and there's a, uh, an RFID sensitive area here where you can swipe a card. Uh, I have my, my charge point card, has a little RFID chip in it. So when I, I pull into one of these locations, uh, I wave my card at it. it, it knows who I am. If it's a charger that has fees associated with it, it can charge those fees to my account. Uh, most of the stations I come across at libraries and the airport and so forth, there's no fee associated with it. You, you still need to wave the card at it, but nothing gets um, uh, uh, charged to your account for it. Um, these stations are popular and becoming more popular. So I'm seeing more and more of them spring up. It's kind of a nice thing. Next kind of public charging is when you're on the road. So you're going somewhere that's far enough away that you need to charge on the way, but you're not at a destination where you really want to stop and spend a few hours to see a, a, a movie or a, a have dinner or whatever. You're, you're on the road and you would like to stay on the road, so you want to charge quickly, um, but you, you, you need to, you know, get some charge so you can finish the rest of the trip. Because of this, you need a much, much faster charging time. The, the couple hours is really not in the cards for you. So we, we go to what's called a level three charger. And here is the case where the charging circuitry actually is on the ground. It's not in the car. Um, in these type of chargers, uh, the charger essentially gets a direct connection uh, through the cable that you're plugging in to the battery. So it's, it's bypassing uh, any of the charging electronics in the vehicle to get a more direct connection to the battery in the car. And there's very high powered electrics, uh, electronics in these charge stations that allow it to take uh, the AC utility and put quite large charge levels into your car. Uh, the bad news with these chargers is that they're not as well standardized. Um, in this area, we have sort of three different um, uh, flavors that you can see if you go around. 
Uh, one of them is called a Chatamo charger, and this is a, a standard that came about in Japan. Uh, so Nissan, Mitsubishi, Asian companies like Kia uh, tend to, to use this standard for the, the charging ports that they put on their car. Um, the initial flavor of it was good for about 50 kilowatts, so that's a lot of toasters or a, a lot of dryers, right? It's, it's quite a, a high power level. Uh, charges at a rate of about 200 miles worth of range per hour. My car, which has a 100 mile range, uh, can charge in a half hour on this type of station. Um, a competing standard is called the CCS, Combined Charging Standard. I think it's what it stands for. Uh, also 50 kilowatts, the plug looks different. The capabilities are very similar. Um, the bad news is you can't put a car with one type of charge plug onto the other station or vice versa. Uh, but again, very similar amount of range available from the CCS charger. Uh, and then last, we, we have the Tesla Supercharger, which has a, a, a little higher power level, about 120 kilowatts, about 360 miles worth of range for every hour that you're plugged in. Uh, that one is for Teslas only. So we other drivers, we, we don't get to use the Tesla charging spots. Um, all of these standards are in a state of flux. They recognize that the cars are getting um, larger batteries put in them as time goes by because people want larger batteries to drive farther and because of that they want to charge faster. So all of these now have higher power levels available at least in theory. Um, the Chatamo and CCS are uh, supposedly available at over 100 kilowatts now and the Tesla at 150 kilowatts. That being said, I I've never been to a station that had higher power levels than these. They, they may exist somewhere, um, but not in any of the areas that I've yet driven. Uh, there are more and more stations coming online that have tackled the, the standardization problem to some degree by, by making it a dual flavor. So um, they handle either a Chatamo or a CCS vehicle with the same charger. And, and it's kind of nice because the BMW guys and the Nissan guys can all go to the same charger and, and make it work. So public charging um, often is associated with networks, right? I showed you my charge point card. That's one of the networks that you can have an account with that allows you to use their chargers. So the, the, the public charging stations are, are often branded, if you will, to a, a particular network. And you need to belong to the club or uh, sign on to it as a guest uh, in order to use that charger. Um, I have a charge point card. It was one of the first ones in this area, and I think it's still the most common one in this area, uh, or even across the entire United States. They have a largest number of, of locations where they have uh, charge stations available. Um, no fee for getting the account or the card. Uh, you link a credit card to your account. It, it works a lot like the um, uh, the easy drive transponder thing where you know you get the transponder for free and as you use it you get down to a certain level it, it debits your credit card and puts money into your account. This works pretty much the same way. Uh, another flavor that's that's around the New England area is uh, called EVGO. Uh, they have fewer locations um, but are very popular at, at uh, malls. I see them a lot at shopping malls. Uh, there's one at Patriot Place, if you go down to Gillette. Um, they tend to have both the slower level two J1772, which are usually free, and the combo Chatamo CCS, which they <coughs> charge you for the privilege of, of picking up some juice off of those. Um, they have a ton of membership options. Um, monthly, per use, whatever. I can't even begin to describe all the different flavors of membership options you have from them. Uh, I, I have used their stations on a guest basis. So uh, with many of these, you can uh, call them up on your phone or put an app on your phone and, and, and get a, a guest session uh, and, and pay for that. 
Uh, lastly, there are uh, several Tesla supercharger uh, and some destination chargers uh, in the area. The superchargers are primarily along major highway routes like the Pike. Um, they do have some destination chargers as well that I've come across, um, uh, a parking garage like in downtown Boston or uh, up at Mount Snow um, uh, at the Heritage, they, or Hermitage, they have um, uh, some destination chargers there. Uh, again, the Tesla locations are, are Tesla only, so you need to own the Tesla to be able to use them. Uh, it's very useful when out and about uh, in needing some charge to have an app to find where the chargers are. And one of the one, you can use a charge point app or an EVgo app, or I'm sure Tesla has an app. And um, I tend to use the plug share app because it allows you to find any of these. And you can filter, uh, say, I, I only want to find uh, Chatamo chargers, or uh, I only want to find um, uh, an EVgo charger. You can set filters, and uh, it also helps with route planning. So you can say, I, I'm going from my home up to Mount Snow, um, what are the chargers that are available along that route? And it will show you, and you can see how far it is in between them, and, and it helps you plan your route so that you'll have the chargers that you need available as you make the journey. Lastly, a few comments about living with an EV. Um, you might guess that a guy who drives an EV thinks that there are a number of advantages to owning an EV. Why else would I have one? Uh, I think my favorite thing about an EV is, is the ride. It's very quiet and has a very smooth ride. Um, most noticeable when um, you're accelerating from a slow speed, there's, there's no engine noise. It's very peaceful. Driving along the highway, you know, you can talk, you can listen to music. It's, it's nice, it's very quiet, I like it. Um, the ride's also smooth, and I would say in two ways. Um, it's smooth in that there are no gear shifts involved. So uh, there is a, a gear reduction, but it's a fixed ratio. So from zero speed up to as fast as you want to go, there are no shifts, no jerks, no ugly stuff in the ride quality. It's just nice and smooth, and it <coughs> accelerates you, pushes you back in the seat like it ought to, and away you go. Uh, it's also smooth in that for their size, electric cars tend to be a touch heavier than their gas-powered counterparts. And that weight is concentrated in the battery, which is mounted very low and central in the vehicle. So you get a low center of gravity. It makes for a ride that's, well, it's, it's not like I'm not going to say my car is like a Rolls Royce. It doesn't ride that nice. But compared with a gasoline equivalent size car, it rides more nicely. It rides like a little bit more expensive of a car. Uh, another thing I really like is the regen braking. And, and part of this comes from, um, well, I don't know if it's because I'm an engineer that I like everything to be efficient and never waste anything, or if it's because I like everything to be efficient and never waste anything that I became an engineer. But whether it was a chicken or an egg doesn't really matter. In a regular car, when you put on the brakes, you're converting all that kinetic energy you have in moving down the road into heat and brake dust and ugly stuff, right? And it just bothers me to do that. It's, it's throwing it away, right? Well, in an electric car, you don't do that. When you come to a stop, um, the electric motor works as a generator. That kinetic energy that you have while moving down the road gets converted into charge that's put back into the battery so that next time you take off, you, you reuse it. And it's, it's one of the big reasons why electric cars are, are so much more efficient. Another feature which is nice about the regen braking is that um, you can control the deceleration rate of the car with the accelerator pedal. So um, obviously, you can stomp down on the accelerator to accelerate. That's no different than a regular car. Um, you can pull your foot most of the way off the accelerator and coast in the car with very little drag and just kind of, you know, coast down the road very nicely. Or if you pick your foot all the way up off the accelerator, uh, it will 
decelerate, it'll use some regeneration, and, and it will decelerate the car more quickly than a regular car does, than an internal combustion engine car does. So I do a lot of my driving without ever having to touch the brake pedal. And, and it, it's something you, you, you get used to when driving an electric vehicle, and it's kind of nice. You can tailor whether you're accelerating or decelerating very finely and very easily just using the one pedal. And it, it's, a, it's a good feel. Um, some other things that I like, uh, lower fuel cost. Um, my previous car that I traded in to get the electric uh, was a nice car, a little economy um, uh, Toyota Yaris, it was called. I got about 40 miles to the gallon on it, um, pretty good. Um, at the time, gas was $4 a gallon. It cost me in fuel about 10 cents per mile to drive that car, pretty good. The electric car um, in my community, my home, where I do most of my charging, uh, electricity is 12 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. I get five miles of driving per kilowatt hour. So it's about two and a half cents for the electricity for me to drive a mile versus the 10 cents that it was when I bought the car. Now, Another part of this fuel cost is that in the gas car, there was a lot more volatility to the price. It was $4 a gallon when I traded the car in. A couple years ago, it went down to $2 a gallon. Uh, now it's about three, I think, although I gotta tell you, I don't pay all that much attention because <laughs> I don't buy gas, so it, it, it doesn't matter that much. Um, so the, the, the amount lower the cost is has varied a lot because the cost of gas has varied a lot. Uh, but it's ranged anywhere from two times lower cost for the electric to three or even four times lower for the electric cost. Uh, another thing I like, uh, the electric car is very clean. Uh, no emissions, it doesn't stink, um, doesn't drip oil in my driveway or garage or, or you know, spew it out on the road. Um, it's a more efficient vehicle, uses less energy than a gas car and a lot less pollution and I think that's a cool thing. Uh, it also is more clean in that when I pop the hood to put in more washer fluid or something, uh, it's not as greasy and grimy and nasty inside as uh, an internal combustion engine car is. It's, it's just cleaner, which is kind of nice. Uh, lower maintenance. Um, I never had huge maintenance problem with my ICE car, but eventually, um, brakes, uh, uh, the exhaust system, um, oil changes regularly, right? There were, there were maintenance items to it. Some of those you have in the electric car, for instance, brakes. I, I obviously have brakes in my electric car, but they're used less. You use regen braking a lot more. You use the friction brakes a lot less. The regen braking doesn't require any maintenance. The friction braking, because you're minimizing its usage, particularly if you're like me and you like regen braking, you don't use the brakes very much, so they need less maintenance. Uh, another biggie, and it, it, it probably should be higher on the list. In fact, I think it would come above lower fuel cost if I were being honest about rating things. More convenient refueling. I, I just plug it in when I'm at home. I mean, I don't have to go to the gas station. I, I, I didn't really think about that before getting the car, but after getting it, it's really nice. I, it's a surprise that, who knew that going to the gas station was such a drag? It is, you know, I'm much happier now that I don't have to go out of my way to go to a gas station and, you know, squirt gas into a car. I just plug it in at home, it's kind of nice. Um, there are some disadvantages to having an electric vehicle, and even I would admit that. Um, not really suitable for long trips. A little bit of qualification there. Uh, I have a, a couple siblings that live along, a brother that lives in California, a sister that lives in Atlanta. There's no car that's suitable for that trip. Not even the Rolls Royce with the super duper ride. You know, forget it, that's just too much driving. Um, but for medium-ish long trips, like say to my mom's house, 500 miles, uh, up to Maine to Acadia, um, down to Provincetown even, depending on your car, right? Those are long enough that, you know, that my car can't do them on one charge. And so for me to undertake a journey 500 miles to go visit with my mom, 
not really practical in the electric car, so I, I don't do it in the electric car. Um, shorter trips around town, prefer the electric car hands down, no question about it. Not good for long ones. Uh, another disadvantage, higher purchase price. Certainly on paper, the MSRP on my car was quite a bit higher than what I would have liked to have paid. Fortunately, the dealer was happy with charging nowhere near the MSRP on it, and I got a much better deal than that. And in fact, after rebates and incentives through both the federal government and the state, um, amounting to $10,000 in total, um, my car was actually cheaper than an equivalent gas-powered car would be when I bought it, which was back in 2015. Um, and I was quite happy about that. Uh, now, these rebo rebates won't last forever, but I think they are and were doing some of their intended job of making these vehicles relatively cost neutral to the gas powered equivalents. Uh, another, I think, disadvantage, less selection available. Um, you know, if you like a particular brand, a particular style, a particular look, um, that car may not be available in electric. If you like pickup trucks, for example, right now I, I don't know of any electric pickup trucks. There are some people talking about coming out with hybrids and it may happen, but right now you know, you're, you're limited in that regard and, and you, you can't really buy uh, as many styles or flavors of electric cars as you can gas cars. That's what I had for the overall talk. I think what we should do at this point is um, take any questions for Dick or I from the crowd, and then we'll bring up some of our EV owners to uh, give you some words of wisdom on how they like their cars and that. So any questions we have? Yes? If your source of electricity is not renewable, aren't you just driving a cold car at this point? Uh, depends a little bit on where you live. Um, there are uh, there certainly in making electricity and generating electricity by the utilities there are some forms that are renewable um, and those are great um, and there are some that are not and they could be natural gas they could be coal they could be nuclear um, there have been studies done on this and um, in areas of the country where there are a lot of renewables as you would expect the footprint of the electric car is very, very small, very, very good relative to an internal combustion engine car. What I found more surprising was that even in areas of the country where coal dominated the, um, the grid, uh, the electric car was still approximately on par with a good internal combustion engine car like a hybrid Prius. Okay, so. It ranges, depending on where you are, from being much better than any internal combustion engine car out there to, at worst, being kind of on par with the best internal combustion engines out there. Um, it's definitely better than the average internal combustion engine car that's out there. The other thing I'd like to say on this is that while the grid does have coal and some other things involved in its generation, they're on the decline, and, and I think um, towards the future, we'll see the grid cleaning up significantly, and that will automatically make the electricity that the cars are doing that much cleaner. So I think it's a good thing today and will be a better thing tomorrow. Um, uh, my name is Jay Agarwal. Uh, I've been in a proponent of electric car for a long time. And I, I, I've been in the battery space for about 40 years. So. I will wait for the uh, electrons to move faster so that we can charge uh, the batteries in, a, in a one hour or half an hour, whatever the time limit is. Mm -hmm. But that will take some time. But in the meanwhile, uh, I have a different approach to the problem. Uh, electric car batteries don't have to be owned. You will have a mechanical way of giving you a full charged battery at a station. You go in, in 10 minutes, you get a new pack. Mm -hmm. Then you can drive 
as long as you want yep. many of those charges. Yes. So the business plan would be entirely different. It, it you would indeed. You have any battery on you by yourself. Charging stations would be around the same area as we have corner gas stations. It would be corner battery stations. So the whole business concept would be very different than what we have now. It, it would. I've seen it proposed, and battery swapping um, has been talked about for, oh, I would say a decade at least, commonly, popularly. Uh, Tesla even did uh, a demo and, and built a station and showed on stage uh, their car pulling in, uh, automated robotics, pulled the battery, swapped it out with a new one. Uh, it was faster. They, they, they showed it while simultaneously uh, having a camera on a guy who pulled in and was doing a fill-up of a, a gas-powered car. And the Tesla with the swap was in and out faster than you could do a gas station thing. Um, it's, it's not picked up in the market, and I think there are some reasons for it. Um, one, perhaps contrary to my talk or what you hear out there, charging is not as big a deal as what you think. Um, it, when, you, when you own a car and when you drive a car, um, you charge it at home, and I, I rarely charge out anywhere else. In fact, I normally don't even plug my car in every day. I probably plug it in twice a week. It's just not necessary for me to do any more than that, and it's not a, a big enough deal to normally to deal with worse than that. I think there's also a strong um, disadvantage to swapping out something in your car that's such an important aspect of the car. Um, I can see that one. And, 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 and there's an issue with the standardization. You'd, you'd have to get all the car manufacturers to agree on this is a battery pack. It's this size, it's this shape, it's these connections, it's these protocols, it's this mechanical interface, it's this electrical, it's this everything, and it's standard. Because there's no way the swap station could have 200 different batteries for 200 different cars. Um, and I, I, think it, I think the odds of having all the manufacturers agree on that one battery is somewhere between slim and none. I, I, I don't see it happening.